2019 was one of the best years in film that I can remember. Making my top 10 list for that year was incredibly challenging because of how stacked the class was. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Parasite, The Irishman, any of the top 5 from 2019 could have easily have been a number 1 in any other year. Yet for me, Robert Eggers' sophomore effort, The Lighthouse, toppled all the competition. Some people didn't like The Lighthouse, and that's understandable because of how unconventional and eccentric it was, but in my humble opinion, just about everything in the movie worked. The black and white, the aspect ratio, the touches of surrealism, the period accurate dialogue, the fart jokes. Well, maybe the fart jokes were a bit shallow and unoriginal, but it does play upon a timeless source of vain humor, and something in that intrigued me about The Lighthouse. Not so much the history and back catalogue of fart jokes, but the fact that The Lighthouse can be at the same time an idiosyncratic period piece from a seemingly obscure age, yet possess a strange, timeless quality to it. A brief and plain synopsis of the plot presents a film that is all but likely to be stale and dusty. Knowing that obviously isn't the case, how is it that The Lighthouse is not only palatable to a modern audience, but is wildly enjoyable? What gives it that timeless feeling? The first answer that pops to mind is the inclusion of mythology in the themes and the subtext. Watching Thomas Howard work like a dog slaving over menial tasks makes us think of Sisyphus rolling his boulder up a hill only to have it roll right back down. The mermaid triggers archetypal images of seductive sirens, and the ending of the film is lifted straight from the tale of the fire-swiping Prometheus, and the names of some ancient Greek gods are even invoked. Let Neptune strike ye dead, Winslow! Oh! The mythological threads woven into the lighthouse are important to remember and keep tabs on, but I don't think that aspect of the film answers the question of timelessness completely. While these images are archetypal to a degree, some of us may be unaware of the ancient Greek origins, and we can argue as well that they've begun to fade from today's collective unconscious. There must be something else besides the cameos of past myths. For a film or story to achieve a myth-like status, I believe, first and foremost, it must be able to portray universal elements of the human experience. These universal elements must be such that they withstand the test of time and can be related to and understood through all kinds of language barriers and cultural change and evolution. There's a quote from Joseph Campbell, the author of The Hero with a Thousand Faces, that I think can apply here. If you live with myths in your mind, you will always find yourself in mythological situations. They cover everything that can happen to you, and that enables you to interpret the myth in relation to life, as well as life in relation to myth. This is an element in which the Greek myths excelled and continue to excel. When we think of a mythological figure like Sisyphus, doomed to fruitlessly exert all of his willpower rolling a boulder up a hill for the rest of eternity, we can relate on some level. After all, we've all had times when our efforts seemed pointless, forcing us to wonder how and if we should continue with our goals. The connection between Howard and Sisyphus is a strong one. From the very first fart, Thomas Wake makes the power dynamic between the two wikis perfectly clear. And by God and by golly, you'll do it, smiling lad, cause you like it. You like it cause I says you will. Wake is in charge of the station and the light, and Howard is going to take care of all the dirty work and be subservient, or get his wages docked. Howard doesn't do it with a smile on his face, but he does it regardless to earn that paycheck. Being a man on the run from his checkered past, he doesn't exactly have the kind of employment freedom he'd like. In a sense, Howard is cut from a familiar cloth. He embodies the archetype of the strong, silent type. Whatever happened to Gary Cooper? The strong, silent type. That was an American. Howard is disagreeable, he resents authority, can only talk about his feelings when he's royally hammered and bottles up all of his frustration and takes it out on a bird. Add in someone like Wake, who's an oppressive tyrant, and that rock quickly becomes a powder keg. Howard swallows his resentment throughout the four-week period, but when it passes, and the tender fails to come and collect the weary wikis, his efforts feel more and more useless, and the introduction of liquor only lubricates the already loose cannons. This is where another point of relation comes in. Many of us are very familiar with the feeling that our work is futile and meaningless, 
but many, many more are closely familiar with having to deal with the crushing tyranny of someone like Wake. It is a sad fact of life that some people, at some point, take a turn for the worse and fester into bitter tyrants who become hateful and pounce upon any minuscule opportunity to assert dominance over others. And unfortunately, we don't have to look too deeply into the past or present to conjure up a list of names. Out of our peers, teachers, bosses, and sometimes even parents, we have a clear image of this kind of person. Whoever they may be, we can all think up examples. Examples that we may even unconsciously swap in for Wake at the film's end. There's no shortage of these kind of tyrants in film either, and in Thomas Wake we get an extreme example. The isolation and psychological manipulation in the lighthouse creates a perfect environment for him to thrive in this respect. When someone treats us in this kind of tyrannical way, it's very easy and pretty much natural for us to take it personally. We know Howard saw Wake's wrought iron rule as an attack on his personal sovereignty, and we can assume he harbored similar feelings towards Winslow as well. When describing his wishes and ambitions, Howard says he simply wants to raise his own roof with no one to tell him what for. The very opposite happens when he's paired with Wake. Circling back to the Greek myth angle, Wake has frequently been compared to the god Proteus, the shape-shifting old man of the sea. That comparison may fit, but regardless, the dynamic of power shared between the two paints the veteran Wiki as a vengeful Old Testament kind of god, and the Greenhorn Wiki as a subject to his wrath. But Wake isn't a god. He's just another man shaped from the mold of the frail, silent strength. A man who lies about small, silly things. A man whose true self only breaches the surface when he's drunk or about to be abandoned. You don't like me cooking? I possibly like the horse shit you fix us for supper. You're fond of me lobster, ain't you? Say it. Say it. Say it. <laughs> Don't leave me! Yes, Wake is a tyrant, but he's also a human, so I believe investigating what could have made him the way he is is worthwhile to get an idea of how an archetypal tyrant is spawned and how not to become one ourselves. Diving into Wake's past will shine the brightest light, but this is a difficult task due to his habitual lies. What we do know about him is that he was a former sailor and he has a lust for the sea even said that his love of the sea is what hamstrung his marriage. Granted, that could all be a lie, but it does seem believable. If we accept that for the truth, then Thomas Wake appears to be a man whose love of the sea trumped any other kind of love in his life. With that being said, it isn't a stretch to think that being marooned on a rock as a lighthouse keeper is a poor alternative to freedom sailing the seas. Wake has become lonely, bitter, and resentful. The only solace he can find is in the Lighthouse Lantern, itself a glaring symbol of safety and sanctuary for lost sailors. With that in mind, the defensiveness that he displays over the sanctity of the light is understandable, but his subsequent actions and constant gaslighting can't really be defended. One context with which we can understand the tyranny that followed is a Jungian one, specifically Carl Jung's theory of the unintegrated shadow. And I won't delve too deeply into the concept of the shadow as I went over it in my Clockwork Orange video from a week or so ago, but if you're interested I'll leave the link in the description and drop a card for it at the top of the video. But just to give you the spark notes, our shadow is essentially the darker side of the self in which repressed desires and urges are drowned beneath the depths of the unconscious mind. The shadow constricts us when we have to adapt to social and cultural norms, smothering natural tendencies such as that of aggression and displacing them into things like envy and hate. Carl Jung believed that integrating the shadow was crucial, as the shadow only grows fatter with time, and when it becomes gluttonous, it possesses the self in a way that makes yourself seem almost unrecognizable. Given the attitude of the two wikis and the period of time they came from, it's almost a given that they had unintegrated shadows. And if we choose to accept and believe in Jung's shadow archetype, then Perhaps unintegrated shadows are a universal problem that's always plagued humanity. And we know we don't have to scroll too far back in the book of history to find examples. Unable to be a sailor anymore, Wake displaced his love for the sea with love of the light, 
and use liquor to flood any complex emotions, giving his shadow free reign. What I find interesting about Howard is how quickly he transitions from the Tyrannize to the Tyrannizer once he gains the upper hand on Wake. Howard's inner shadow gained momentum when he allowed Winslow to be killed and fully unleashed itself once the opportunity to dominate Wake materialized. Howard took the most exception to being called a dog, so it's not surprising that he projected that punishment onto Wake in the most extreme fashion. Get up here. <clears throat> what? <sighs> now you get in there where you belong. You do as I say, dog. There's a common saying in the business world, never outshine the master. In communicating with your boss, never show yourself to be more intelligent than them or superior in any other way, or you risk triggering their insecurities and suffering their wrath. This isn't the exact trajectory that follows between Howard and Wake in the lighthouse. Howard doesn't necessarily show himself to be more superior or intelligent, but he develops an intense desire for the light. That makes Wake view him as a threat in a similar fashion. Threatening to steal the light, the only thing that Wake loves, gives him a method of justifying his psychological abuse of Howard, a method that fosters intense resentment and ultimately leads to his own demise. We have an idea of why Wake loves the light and wishes to hoard it for himself, but why exactly did Howard want the light? I believe the answer stems from another universal theme of humanity, that of desire. In Viktor Frankl's book Man's Search for Meaning, he writes about his experiences at Auschwitz and recounts many of the psychological insights he gleaned from his time there. One of the insights that always stuck with me was how many of the men atrophied, both physically and spiritually, when the goals they aimed at, the goals they desired for, were suddenly halted and dissolved. Frankel writes that any attempt at fighting the camp's psychopathological influence on the prisoner by psychotherapeutic methods had to aim at giving him inner strength by pointing out to him a future goal to which he could look forward. Instinctively, some of the prisoners attempted to find one on their own. It's a peculiarity of man that he can only live by looking to the future. And this is his salvation in the most difficult moments of his existence although he sometimes has to force his mind to the task. Salvation, said he. When it became apparent to Howard that he was going to be stuck with Wake indefinitely, liquor helped, but the only way for his miserable existence to be worth continuing was by finding some kind of goal, a salvation, Wake's mysterious and coveted light. Wake's monopoly over the light, symbolizing the rigorous authority Howard hated so much, could have been a major contributor to his fixation with it, as well as the sheer mystery of the light's allure. One of the big questions that the lighthouse leaves us with is what exactly is the light? What's in it? Is it something supernatural? Something metaphysical? Many have crafted their theories on the light's mystery, but in my opinion it's very possible that the light is just a simple light. Nothing strange or supernatural about it. The light was a source of comfort and security for Wake, and he wasn't interested in sharing. The scene of Howard watching the tentacle writhing along the grate was a hallucination or a dream. The confines of the light was the mystery that kept Howard's sanity glued together, and at the end, when he realized that it was nothing but an ordinary light, he could only laugh as it zapped him with the reality of the situation. Once Howard realized his desire was meaningless, his will to live on in the grim conditions were extinguished. Frankel recalls a similar anecdote in his book. A fellow prisoner sought him out one day and told him about a dream in which they would be liberated from the camp on March the 30th. It excited the prisoner and filled him with hope. On March the 29th, it appeared very unlikely that his premonition would come to fruition, and subsequently he suddenly became sick. On the 30th, they were not liberated, and the prisoner became delirious. On the 31st, he passed away. As Frankel writes, The sudden loss of hope and courage can have a deadly effect, and if we give any credence to this theory on the light, it's likely that something similar happened to Howard. But that's just one interpretation to the film's ending. It can be just as likely that there truly was some kind of supernatural essence in the light, and that's the beauty of the lighthouse. 
Ultimately, I believe the film not only works, but excels in the strange pocket of time it takes place in because it emphasizes universal, timeless themes of desire, dominance, and human evil. And on top of that, Eggers makes the wise decision to preserve the mystery of the light, ensuring that like any great myth, the story will continue to live on long after the credits have rolled.